Hi there, welcome back to the Science House Express chat. I am Dr. Pam Gilchrist, the Director of Imhotep and Anderson Academy at the Science House. Today we're chatting with Dr. Francis De Los Reyes, a professor of civil construction and environmental engineering at NC State University and a faculty fellow. Francis' research focused on addressing fundamental and practical issues in environmental biotechnology and engineering. Another research focus of his is sanitation in developing countries. He has conducted workshops for wastewater treatment plant operators and professionals in the U.S. and the Philippines, work in water and sanitation issues in developing countries, and his collaborations has spanned in the areas of Philippines, India, China, South Africa, Belgium, and Malawi. He is a TED Fellow, and his TED Talk on sanitation has been viewed over 800,000 times. Thank you for joining us. We are so excited to be talking with you today, Francis. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you and all your, your viewers. Awesome. So we're going to start off. Would you tell us a bit about yourself and what drew your interest in this field? Uh, sure, yeah. So I have been teaching and doing research at NC State for 20 years now. Um, and during that time, I teach graduate and undergraduate classes. I've, uh, I'm originally from the Philippines. I grew up in the Philippines, did my undergraduate degree in agricultural engineering, and then went to the U.S. to do my graduate uh, schooling in environmental engineering at Iowa State University and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And that's when I really got uh, into thinking about the environment and, you know, what is it that I really want to focus on. Uh, growing up, I've always been in water and I always thought that protecting the environment uh, was one of uh, my passions. Um, and I found a way to connect my interest in engineering, in science, and so STEM. We didn't have that acronym yet at that time. But I always uh, loved math. I loved um, science. And my father was a mechanical engineer. So I was really impressed by how engineers are able to, to really explain the world and also do something about it. And so I knew I wanted to go into engineering. Um, I did start with agricultural engineering, uh, learned a lot about water. And then I transitioned to environmental engineering and learn more about microbes and what they do. Uh, and I thought, wow, that's the way to combine my interest in, in microbiology and biotechnology and uh, environmental engineering. So, and then from there, um, just got interested also in all kinds of things, including waste treatment and then uh, global sanitation. Again, coming from the Philippines, I thought that um, we have a lot of problems uh, in the Philippines in terms of sanitation. And um, there's also a lot of problems all over the world. And I thought that I could use some of my knowledge and expertise to help address some of those problems. So it's been a long journey, but that's kind of like how it got started. And, um, you know, we're still working in the field. And uh, yes, I, I brought and I'm wearing my poop shirt. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So your curiosity about the environment and being in a family where you you was an engineer kind of shaped your interest and focus. Can you tell me what drives your passion for sharing your work with students and families? Yeah, so as a uh, professor, uh, it's really one of the, the, the joys and the perks of the job is to see students um, really expand their understanding and their knowledge. And, you know, especially at the undergraduate and then also at the graduate level, uh, you know, you see them come in, um, you know, they're passionate about learning about the environment, um, but they're not quite sure yet. You know, they don't have the, the skills or the concepts. And over the course of several years, you see them progress. And when they do come out, it's, it's a joy uh, to see students and also go on and become uh, successful professionals. So it, it, uh, it really is the, uh, the, the driving force, if you will. Um, and then obviously just understanding that the more people we can get into this field, um, the more we can get young people excited, um, you know, thinking about these problems because these are important problems and we need all the brightest minds out there to, to solve these problems. Um, 
you know, it's not going to be all fixed in, in our generation, but hopefully the, the young people out there uh, get excited about by this. And, um, you know, if they do, then, then they will have a future where they will feel hopefully fulfilled in solving some big global issues, but at the same time using their talents and their interest in STEM. Okay. Thank you. So you had mentioned a bit about poop when you were sharing um, what drove your interest in the field. So I would like to ask you, what is the coolest thing you do about your <laughs> uh, Okay. So there are so many cool things. You asked about the coolest thing. Uh, uh, it is cool when we do go out to the field. Let's say we're in Malawi or you know Rwanda or Zambia or Tanzania and you know, we go to, um, to a field site and these are communities where they usually have pit latrines maybe. And uh, through our uh, partnerships with organizations and universities in those areas, we're able to do research in those communities. And, you know, we open up pit latrines and, um, you know, analyze uh, contents of pit latrines. We analyze how we can get them out, how we can treat them. Uh, that's pretty cool. And there's always cool, exciting stories uh, when we're, you know, back in the field. Lots of different experiences when we're traveling and doing field work. Um, but what's also cool is when you when you see some of the, um, uh, the advances work or some of the, uh, the prototypes work in the field. Uh, and it's always a learning experience because we apply these uh, new prototypes to the field, and then we sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And but we but we learn every time we go out. So that's always exciting when we find something that works. Um, you know, as an engineer, you know, again seeing things work. Uh, as a teacher, I guess I share that. You know, seeing students uh, improve over time, and start becoming confident in their skills, and then go out and do great things. That's always very cool. As a researcher, it's always cool when you feel like we've sort of discovered something that maybe nobody has reported before. You know, so whether that's putting out a new paper on some topic uh, that advances the knowledge, or whether that's presenting at a conference for the first time some new results, that's that's always cool. Sorry, there's so many cool things. I couldn't boil it down to one. Okay, if you have a few others. Like. <laughs> yeah. These top five coolest things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so while you have really amazing things that you do in your work, um, what is the biggest challenge or some of the challenges you face in your research? Uh, yeah, so there's always lots of different challenges. Trying to find um, research funding for some of the things that we do is always a challenge. You know, a global sanitation uh, even though we understand that a lot of people, a lot of agencies around the world understand that this is a big global problem, there's probably not as much uh, research dollars that go into this particular field. Uh, so we have to be creative about how we are able to, um, to fund some of the things that uh, we need to do uh, in terms of the research. You know, that's, that's always a, a challenge. Um, you know, sometimes this type of work is seen as, you know, not the leading edge of research. Sometimes agencies and even governments think that advances in technology, you know, robots or AI or, you know, computing. Um, and those are really also exciting fields, right? Um, and so, you know, but sanitation, it seems very basic, I guess. And so, you know, trying to make people understand that uh, although these are basic things and we take them for granted here in the U.S. and in the, you know, high income countries, it's really it still is a problem overseas. And, and we can use some of our uh, latest technologies to, you know, to work on these problems and challenges. So convincing partners, convincing funding agencies, even governments and organizations about the, you know, the need for research in this field, that's, that's a big challenge. It's not so much a big challenge to, to get good students interested in this area. You know, a lot of students right now, a lot of young people are really passionate about the environment and 
you know, finding meaning in their work. And so we, we do a lot, uh, we do attract a lot of students. I, I think the issue has always been, you know, we have a lot more interest and um, good people than, than we can than we can fund. A big challenge, obviously, in, in, you know, for any faculty member is making sure that um, you manage your time wisely. And there's so many things that you want to do. So, um, you know, being wise about managing your time is a challenge. So for a student who is thinking about your research or what it is you do specifically, I would like for you to expound a bit more on that and to share what is the thing you wish people knew about biotechnology or sanitation that they typically don't know? Oh, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, and lots of things, again, lots of answers. I think right now with the situation that we're in, uh, with the pandemic, it, it becomes quite uh, obvious and more visible to people how these, you know, little things that we cannot see, you know, viruses and pathogens, bacteria can actually have huge impacts. And so microbiology and biotechnology, I mean, these these are dependent on microbes and, and we use microorganisms uh, in a good way also. So they're not all bad. Um, uh, they're not all public you know, health uh, enemies, um, but we use microorganisms in a lot of things that we do. So when we're making products, when we're transforming wastes, we're using microorganisms and you know, how to best use these microorganisms, how to best control or influence their, you know, metabolism or growth. That is one thing that is crucial and central to environmental biotechnology. So hopefully people will understand that, yeah, that's something that we um, study and we do research on and uh, we use them. So microorganisms are everywhere, they're important, and they actually control a lot of things um, in, in our you know, daily life. Um, so there are good microbes, there are bad microbes, obviously, and we're just trying to use the good microbes and, and try to prevent the bad microbes from you know, affecting public health. Um, so I guess that's the main thing that most people don't probably realize. Okay, so so your with your research, would you talk a bit more about you know some research you currently the research you're currently doing in your lab now with some of your students? Yeah, so uh, the most current one, uh, we just got funding to to use wastewater surveillance. Um, I don't know if you heard about this, Pam, but uh, we got some NSF funding to use molecular techniques to detect virus that causes COVID nineteen. SARS-CoV-2 in the influence of wastewater, yeah. So we've been sampling the city of Raleigh, the sewer line, the influence of the wastewater treatment plant, and pretty soon we'll be sampling also five other wastewater treatment plants in the area. And our goal there is to, to see if we can use this approach to inform policymakers about the increase or decrease of COVID-19 in the wastewater, which hopefully will correlate with the infection rates in a community. So it's another piece of data that might help with policy making. Uh, so we call that trends tracking. If, if the trend of the increase of the virus in the wastewater tracks with the increase in the infection rates, then what we have is a method of simultaneously sampling hundreds of thousands of people with one wastewater sample because all their wastewater goes to the same place. Instead of testing one by one, we could potentially have information about hundreds of thousands of people at the same time. Uh, and we can do that over time and see the increases or decreases. So that's the most current one that we're doing. Uh, we have research on um, anaerobic uh, food waste digestion to convert that to energy, to methane. So what people, most people think about as waste, we want to think of as resources. So this whole idea of you know, it's not waste, it's something that we can use to uh, provide products such as acids that we can sell in the marketplace or energy in the form of methane, for example. So those are two different projects that are ongoing right now. Uh, there are uh, two projects on nitrogen removal, removal of a pollutant in the wastewater. And this is with the city of Raleigh again and um, with funding by state agencies. We're trying to come up with new methods, new techniques 
that are uh, more effective, but at the same time, less costly for our wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, and there is an ongoing project that's been around for a few, for many years now, um, since 2011. That's uh, work on funding uh, with the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that's work on developing a machine that will uh, eliminate the need for manual emptying of pit latrines. Mm-hmm. So there are about 1.8 billion pit latrines in the world, and they are, for the most part, uh, emptied manually. So people use hand tools to take out the fecal sludge, um, remove them, transport them, and, and treat them. And as you can imagine, this is very dirty work and undignified work. And the Gates Foundation funded this project to come up with a mechanical way of doing it so that it's it's more professional, it's cleaner, and it doesn't put the uh, the workers at risk. And so we have a product that we believe has the potential to be commercialized. It's it's uh, hopefully a year or two away from being available in the marketplace. And in fact, we're looking for commercial partners to to uh, take that to scale. So. That's a project that uh, has taken us all over the world, looking at the different characteristics of fecal sludge and pit latrines. You know, along that line, there are several other projects with treatment and transport. I, you know, I don't know if you have time for all of that, but um, lots of different exciting projects. Uh, you're doing amazing work, even just with you know relevant work that has impacts to our daily activities when it comes to COVID, looking at wastewater, finding ways to remove contaminants. All that is huge work that will make a difference in how our government makes decisions and protect you know the public health of the the state, which is great work, and even global work that you're doing. So our our theme this week is water, and uh, we're looking at its scarcity and its properties. Um, What makes access to clean water and sanitation relevant to the research that you're doing in the world? Yeah, so, you know, for us and for me personally, this is a very important thing. Um, It's one of the uh, sustainable development goals that the United Nations has uh, so SDG 6 mm-hmm. pertains to uh, to water and sanitation. And, you know, I believe fundamentally it's a human right. I believe that for people to prosper, for economies to develop, that they should have adequate infrastructure. And sanitation and water are very, very basic infrastructure uh, that's needed. And in fact, if you look at the, um, um, the benefits, if a country... Uh, doesn't have proper water, um, you know, clean drinking water for its citizens uh, or sanitation facilities, then they're actually losing, you know, uh, three, four, five, you know, up to even 9% of their GDP. Uh, And so that's a lot of um, potential, economic potential that's not, um, that's not tapped. Um, uh, In addition, you know, the impacts of uh, lack of access to water and sanitation are are not even. Uh, The most marginalized, the most under-resourced places are the ones that are hit the most. Um, So for us, you know, the importance of that is making sure we live also in an equitable world where, um, you know, it's not just the well-off that are serviced by um, you know, infrastructures is just water and sanitation. Um, it's, in, it's interesting if you really do the uh, analysis. We actually, in the U.S., for example, pay less for water and sanitation than maybe poor people in a developing country. So it's, it, you know, it's, uh, to me, it makes sense economically if we invest. Uh, and there are economic studies that show this. If we invest in water and sanitation, you know, you get something like, you know, Eight to thirteen dollars back, but back for every dollar that you invest. So the, the it's a wise investment. It's a uh, something that um, addresses equity issues. It addresses gender issues. Um, you know, women and children are the most affected. They're the ones who are in charge of bringing the water, of of cleaning the pit latrines. Um, you know, you can imagine in a lot of these countries too, uh, girls. 
you know, have a high absent, absenteeism rate from school. They, they don't go to school um, because they're affected by, you know, privacy issues when they have their, uh, you know, monthly uh, menstruation periods. You know, they, they don't want to go to school. And you can imagine the, the downstream impacts of that if, if uh, girls are not going to school and, and they don't have proper education. Um, so there are so many impacts that uh, sanitation and water, obviously, um, you know, touch on, and and they're all interrelated. It's it's a it's a system thing, and for us, if we can only work on uh, one thing, and use what we know from the science and the research side mm-hmm. to uh, create some impact, I think, you know, that's probably what we can contribute. You know, we can't solve all the problems, well, but we can at least try to use what we know. Uh, and again, that's the exciting thing because we're using STEM, mm-hmm. you know, to address a real issue that uh, hopefully it will have, you know, a bigger and bigger impact. Yeah, I, I think the, the broad impact is, is critical because we think about water is essential for human existence and the sustainability of the planet. So it connects to the, you know, ensuring that sanitation is addressed in a proper manner and going and beyond those aspects. And collaboration is key within that, as you right. say. Right, right. Well, thank you. So what advice would you give to young girls and boys wanting to go into your field? Uh, oh, yeah, wow. Um, well, um, well, my advice is, uh, you know, um, keep reading. Reading, uh, you know, read books that, you know, that, excite you um you know uh try to uh find um things that you uh enjoy and um in terms of just different topics right so it's sometimes um you know i don't want to say just study water right but actually i want to say study things that fascinate you uh, whether it's dinosaurs or engines or water or soil or, you know, vegetables, you know, I think just, you know, study what interests you, um, read a lot. Um, there are a lot of resources and, and games that you can play. Um, and just, you know, keep learning. I think, I think if you enjoy learning, if you enjoy, you know, reading about things, you know, that's always the best. And then later on, if you, you know, get excited by microbes or water uh, or engineering, then yeah, think about um, uh, the different kinds of problems you might want to solve. I think in general, that's what I tell young people is, you know, don't think of careers, don't think of fields of study, but think about the different kinds of problems you want to solve. And there's so many in the world. It's an exciting time, you know, to to grow up. I know it's also scary sometimes, but um, it's an exciting time to to really learn about all the different challenges that we have uh, around the world. And whatever problem that is, um, if you're interested in that and learning more about that problem, I, I think that really bodes well and that, you know, later on you can decide what you want to be. But keep reading and learning. I guess that's the number one advice that I would give. Um, Because you never know. I mean, you really never know. Sometimes some of these ideas do come from different fields. All the experiences and books and things that you've learned, sometimes they give you some ideas that other people might not have thought of. So, you know, know, keep enjoying learning. So don't lose that um, fascination. Don't lose that spark. Awesome. So keep learning, keep reading and doing what you're passionate about and look forward towards answering questions that impact our world. Well, Francis, thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Francis. Next week, we will be speaking to another great scientist or engineer, so be sure to join in. Until next time, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. Additional information can be found in the description box below. Thank you for watching the Science House Express chat. See you next week.